Here you see the best animation of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And on the surface of the virus, you see about 25 uh, spike proteins. And these spike proteins are important because the virus uses the spike protein as a key to enter the cells of our body. Next slide, please. So for the duration of the pandemic, we had four important variants of concern, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Notice that we experienced alpha, beta, and delta surges in the Philippines, but not really a significant gamma surge. Next slide, please. We now have Omicron, and this is the, so this makes the fifth of the important variants of concern. And the most significant change is that this uh, virus, this version of the virus has 50 plus mutations. Next slide, please. Let me explain so different variants have different spike proteins. It is the same uh, COVID-19 virus. It's the same SARS-CoV-2 virus, but different variants have different spike proteins. Next slide, please. And what you can see here is a comparison of the spike protein on the left of the Delta variant and the spike protein on the right of Omicron. Red indicates change. And as you can see, there are a few red spots in Delta, but on the right with Omicron, there is significant red, which means that the shape of the spike protein is different. And the reason that this is important, Paul, is because the antibodies in our blood recognize the shape of the spike protein. And so if the shape changes dramatically, this could mean that, trans that uh, the virus is able to escape the immune protection that we have either from a previous infection of COVID-19 or from vaccination. Next slide, please. So what I would like to go over now is the clinical data that is uh, coming out of South Africa. So this is the first graph from December 2nd. So it's only four days ago. And what you see on the left-hand side, Paul, is the daily cases comparing the Omicron wave with the previous waves that uh, were experienced in South Africa. So they, the South Africa had a Delta wave, a Beta wave, and the first Wuhan wave, very similar to the Philippines. And what you can see that is most striking, Paul, is that the red line is very sharp and it's going up very quickly, which suggests that the Omicron wave is exploding uh, in a way that is faster than the Delta the, or the beta waves that, that we experienced in the past. The middle graph shows you the positivity rate. And again, what you're seeing here is that the Omicron variant is exploding in South Africa. But what is most important for is on the right. On the right, you see the hospitalizations in South Africa. And what you see is despite the accelerating numbers of cases of Omicron, the hospitalizations are on track and they're not rising fast. They're very similar to the other waves of, of, of the variants in, in South Africa. Next slide, please. This is the preliminary data that was published on Saturday. But what we're looking at here now is the relative risk persons. So uh, on this graph, if you were 100%, if the red line was 100%, then the risk is comparable between an unvaccinated and a vaccinated Filipino. What you can see is that the Delta wave had a 9% relative risk. And we can see that the Omicron wave is three times higher than the Delta wave. So it is true that the preliminary data coming from South Africa suggests that the Omicron variant is more transmissible amongst vaccinated individuals. Next slide, please. But it is really important to focus on hospitalization spot. So if you look at the hospital hospitalizations, this is a screen grab from a presentation from the Department of Health in South Africa from the province of Gauteng, which is the hot spot for the Omicron explosion that is currently taking place. What you can see is that the preliminary data suggests that 
uh, 10 times more unvaccinated individuals are being hospitalized as compared to vaccinated individuals. This is incredibly hopeful, especially since, as I highlighted before, uh, because of the NCR plus eight strategy, our cities and first class municipalities, which is the target for uh, Omicron when it arrives in the Philippines are highly vaccinated. Next slide, please. This is data from the Swain district of South Africa from three days ago, Paul. So this is the most recent data that we can get on the Omicron. Next slide, please. Uh, what you can see from a few days ago is that this district in South Africa is experiencing a dramatic surge of COVID-19. Uh, they're experiencing 3,000 cases per day on the 3rd of December. Uh, on the right, you see that uh, many of the hospitalizations are still uh, are of people 50 years and below. Next slide, please. Despite the number of COVID-19 positives, however, the Omicron hospitalizations are quite low. So you have only something to the effect of 42 to 29 hospitalizations, despite the thousands of individuals who are testing positive for COVID-19. Next slide, please. What is important is that if you look at the numbers of the uh, people who were hospitalized, what is so amazing about the Omicron is that only that is that 70 percent of them do not need oxygen. Paul. And this is very different from the Delta experience that we experienced throughout the world and in the last few months in the Philippines. So we have 30 we have 31 percent require oxygen. 70 percent do not require oxygen. Uh, next slide, please. And what is striking is that 10 of the 11 people who needed uh, oxygen uh, were unvaccinated. And again, what this suggests is that if you are vaccinated, uh, this will protect you against severe disease and hospitalizations, even with Omicron, which is good news for us. Next slide, please. So there are three important questions that the scientists of the world are waiting for. Is the Omicron variant more transmissible? It is likely thought that it is more transmissible. Is the Omicron variant more immune evasive? Probably thought uh, that the, the initial data seems to look like that. Is the Omicron variant more deadly? And this is the good news, Paul. It's probably less deadly than Delta. Uh, I have to point out, Paul, that this is preliminary data, and we are waiting for data from the older populations in the global north, because there are not many lolos and lolas in South Africa. And so most of the uh, patients that we are seeing in the hospitals of South Africa are relatively young. We still do not know, Paul, what will happen when, it, uh, when Omicron begins to spread in the northern part of the world, where more of the population are older. We, I also have to point out that hospitalizations are a lagging indicator. It usually takes a week or two weeks after a surge to see the hospitalizations. But the data from South Africa is very hopeful, especially since they have already been dealing with the surge for at least a week or two. And the hospitalizations do not seem to be dramatically increasing. Paul. Next slide, please. Based on this, I would like to uh, suggest the following for preparations for the arrival of the Omicron variant in the Philippines. Uh, first, there is no need to panic. Uh, we Let us celebrate Pasco. This is the best time uh, in 20 months for the entire country. Uh, you know, I am so proud to be a Filipino because I boast of this. Here in the United States, I say we have 500 cases for yesterday compared to 120,000. The positivity rate is less than 2%. This is some of the best numbers in the world. And so this is not the time to panic. It is the time to be careful. We have to prepare, but we also have to celebrate, especially since this is Christmas. We must prepare the hospital infrastructure and increase healthcare worker staffing capacity, Paul, because over in the alpha and delta surges, it was clear that we had nursing shortages, especially in the NCR. We have to continue to vaccinate and to boost our kababayans to build and maintain population immunity. This is really important, Paul, because the experience of Israel and other countries that, that uh, vaccinated early showed that it is important to boost 
at the appropriate time to maintain a population immunity. Uh, we must increase the population immunity around our international gateways. Omicron will enter through an airport, most likely. And so what we have to do is we have to build a wall of vaccinated Filipinos around these airports because once Omicron arrives, it will try to spread into the Filipino population. And if the Filipinos around the airports, Paul, and this was the, the rationale and strategy for the NCR plus eight, are heavily vaccinated, then it doesn't matter if there is an OFW who returns home. Because even if this person is able to enter the community, the virus will struggle. Uh, my university, Paul, in the United States has a 98% vaccination coverage in our staff and our students. And every time a student goes out and gets a COVID-19, when he returns, no one else gets sick. The, and we are dealing with Delta. It is struggling because of the high numbers of vaccination. Uh, the population is protected. However, I, for our Kababayans who are watching me, I must urge you to get vaccinated because Omicron, when it arrives in the Philippines, will find every unvaccinated Filipino and you will get sick. And even though it is mild, it is still it is still COVID-19. And we do not want to put ourselves and our beloved uh, family members, especially our lolos and lolas, it, into, we do not want to risk them, to risk their lives and their well-being and their livelihoods, especially at this time. I would like to end my presentation Paul, with a short discussion of the antiviral drugs. God bless. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the importance, Paul, of em emphasizing the antiviral drugs is that they're equally effective against all variants of SARS-CoV-2. One of the things is that, you know, the, the, the vaccines depend upon the variants, but the antiviral drugs are equally effective. Next slide, please. And the reason for this, Paul, is that um, these drugs work on the virus. They kill the virus once the virus enters the human cells. And so the outside of the virus will change with the different variants, but the inside part will not change. And so uh, Pfizer's Paxlovid and uh, Merck's Malnopuravir will be effective. Next slide, please. And this is the most recent data on the antivirals that's coming out of Merck and Pfizer. I know that Merck's Malnopiravir has already been authorized by Compa for compassionate use in the Philippines. And I thank Secretary du Duque and the DOH for that. Uh, what you're seeing here, Paul, is that when in clinical trials with high-risk patients, low loss, low loss with underlying comorbidities, uh, the Merck antiviral was able to prevent 30% from of the of the high-risk patients from entering the hospital. But look, Paul, at, at Pfizer, 90% protection for high-risk patients from entering the hospitals. In comparing deaths, so both of these drugs were able to prevent deaths as compared to non-drugs, which had nine for molnupiravir and seven for Paxlovid. And what this means, Paul, is that if a Filipino gets COVID and is at high risk, what we would have to do if we have these drugs is we have to give this Filipino or Kababayan 10 pills, two every day for five days. That is all that is needed. And we will be able to prevent him from entering the hospital. He will be sick at home, but it will be mild. He will not be hospitalized. Now, the cost here in the United States is $700 for the entire uh, 10, dos 10 doses and Paxlovid 500. But I know that Merck has already opened its license for the, for the, for, for, um, the manufacturing of generic versions. And I know that the Philippines uh, will have access to this. So next slide, please. This is, um, so the way out of this pandemic is through vaccinations, which we are doing now, Paul. Uh, and we must continue to do that and to maintain our immunity, especially with the Omicron threat. And we now have to also focus our efforts on procuring antiviral drugs. This combination port will transform pandemic COVID-19 into endemic COVID-19, where we'll be able to reopen completely our societies uh, and where COVID-19 will become a regular flu.